Hello and welcome to the sixth episode of the Mike McNair Revolutionary Strategy Series. Today is Friday the 29th of March 2019 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. We continue with our reading of the second chapter, Reform Coalition or Mass Strike, with panel stalwarts Lexi and Grant of Swampside Chats. We give the mass strike strategy espoused by Rosa Luxemburg et al. a terror hauling over the coals. If you'd like to help keep the episodes flowing, you too can join the Patreon gang gang for only $5 a month, about $1 an episode. This month I have the Patreon ALP1137 to thank. When we hit 50 patrons, I'll produce an extra patron only podcast every month, and the remaining few patrons who sign up from now till then will receive an exclusive handmade Kami badge as a bonus. So if that's your bag, just click on that there Patreon button. If you'd like to comment on the show, please do so on the YouTube channel. I'll try my best to respond to each and every one of them. And make sure to like, subscribe and share. And you can join me on Facebook or Twitter too. Okay, to the reading group. Moving on, let's go on, let's move on. The left's negative yeah. claim. So this is the idea of what is associated with Luxembourg and the mass strike and that the in the revolutionary strike and the fervor of the working class, they will be able to burst through and grab control of the state, essentially, if I'm paraphrasing that correctly. Let's read this this paragraph here. Probably it would be to smash the state, actually. They would they would do this instead of doing any kind of government. In, in, instead of like setting up a government, instead of taking control of the state, they do this in order to not be put in that position. Here in this paragraph, though, we see the either demanding the transfer of political power to the working class. That's kind of but th- that state power. That that for McNair doesn't mean keep the existing state together. Okay, okay. go on. Let, let, let's read this paragraph. Okay. Uh, The proposal of the left was that the international could take the political initiative by extending the use of the strike weapon in support of the demands of the minimum program. As the working class was increasingly able to win victories by this weapon, its confidence and political self-assertiveness would grow, culminating perhaps in a general strike which challenged for power, either demanding the transfer of political power to the working class or, in the most pecuninous form, immediately beginning the creation of the new society out of the free cooperation begun in the strike movement. Okay, it's weird, like, the last sentence there strikes me as what Occupy tried to do. You had your library in it, you had your your health center, you had the food bit, you had, it was like a model of society run on a, you know, on some kind of a cooperative basis. It is born from the struggle. The the necessary forms of organization emerge from the struggle. And not only do they emerge from the struggle, but for this last form here, we immediately begin the creation of the new society. Now, I do want to say, yeah, Bakunin thought a dictatorship of the proletariat was a bad idea would always end up a dictatorship over the proletariat and that we, we got to skip straight to, you know, lower stage communism, like right now, basically. Actually, some of the some of the best Marxists alive today, at least in terms of like analysis, hold to something like this, which is why I found McNair to be such a breath of fresh air. Yeah, it seems to me kind of so obviously stupid that you couldn't practice beforehand. Why can't you build up structures within your society that will prepare people for when it happens whether they're a party or other forms but this idea that when it happens then you all have to figure it all out and there's going to be mayhem it's going to all now work and stuff it just it seems to really fetishize the idea of revolution over planning and just straightforward organization like if you've got wrong organizational forms as in the party and how it operated in the 20th century it's like try and fix that don't just try and, and hope for the best when it, when something happens. They like, do have a point that revolutions are incredibly chaotic and move behind the backs of actors. And very rarely in a revolution, people execute a plan and this and that and the other. But the, a communist revolution would have to be fundamentally different from previous revolutions in ways that, you know, we can't be entirely sure of beforehand. So we're going to go on here to the left's negative and its positive claim. Let's have a look at what he says here. 
The negative claim was that the method of electoral struggle and coalitions, or even the effort to build permanent mass workers' organizations, as opposed to ad hoc organizations of mass struggle, like strike committees, necessarily led to corruption of the workers' representatives and organizations, and the evolution of these organizations into mere forms of capitalist control of the working class. The positive claim was that the method of the strike struggle could be extended and generalized. Experience has something to tell us about the value of these claims. So he's going to go in here and basically slate Lenin. Who wants to read this paragraph here that's going to slate, slate the Leninist experience? Lexi, you've been doing it lately. Why don't you do it this time? It's just right. I've, I've lost friends over this. But yes, the negative claim may, on its face, appear to be amply proved by the experience of the 20th century. It is certainly true of the policy of reform through coalition governments for the reasons given above. On the experience of the 20th century, it appears to be also true of the Leninist party, quote, which claimed to escape it. Those communist parties which took power became corrupt apparatuses tyrannizing over the working classes of their countries, and most have ended in a return to capitalism. While most of the, quote, official CPs of the capitalist countries have become simple reformist parties of the kind advocated by the right wing of the Second International. The groups to their left have, to the same extent that they have attained mass support, gone down the same path and, to the extent that they have not, have in the main become fossilized sects, in either case characterized internally by the petty dictatorship of the party bureaucracy. The trouble is that if the left's negative claim is taken seriously to be simply true, it is self-defeating. If any effort to organize outside strikes leads to corruption, nothing can be done until the masses move into a mass strike wave. Because to organize in any other situation, would imply the struggle for reforms, including electoral activity, coalitions, and organizational forms which turn out to be corrupt. Unfortunately, however, as we will see in a moment, when a mass strike wave does break out, this in itself immediately poses the questions of government and forms of authority. So I went a little further, but I think this is worth putting out there. Tom, you might be surprised, or maybe nothing surprises you, to know that the, uh, the first part of that second paragraph that I read that there, there are nihilist communists that essentially not, they don't literally think we should do nothing, but they think so much of what the left does is, is so counterproductive that they use, we should do nothing as a slogan to discourage leftists from doing what they're going to do. It's hard to argue that most of the stuff, well, not most, that's obviously wrong, that an awful lot of the stuff that the far left does is meaningless or or worse, yeah, worse yeah, than negative. meaning. Yeah, and uh, I've had these arguments with people before I was ever politicized. I think it's true. You know, that if you have a party form whereby once there is a crisis, it's so centralized that you can essentially cut down all political life forever in the country. That's a problem with organizational form or a problem with the timing of when you've taken your revolution, that it leads to it. To me, that's just like pretty basic. Like, how come the the Leninist parties that were, you know, the Bolsheviks that ended up in, how come 1970s Russia, how come they didn't allow political life? You know, World War II is over 30 years. What is it about it? They have the atom bomb. No one can invade them. What is it about them that they didn't, weren't able to go back? That's a pretty fundamental question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, it's fair enough in the war, you know, you know, in a revolutionary war or a civil war, some stuff goes down grand. But how come it happened in America after the civil war and it didn't happen in Russia? You've got you've got 5000, you've got 10,000 nuclear bombs. Nobody can come close to you. You know, it says something deeply fundamentally wrong with the political structure that's undeniable. And while there's obviously too many differences between the American Civil War and the Russian Civil War. To make a direct parallel, McNair does answer about the way Lincoln maintained democratic norms within the Union side. Of course, he was in war, so there was open conflict and repression of the enemy, but it's something Leninists could learn from. I I think one bit you would say is that it wasn't like once you won the war that you had a different a, a very different type of government than if you had lost the war. 
in some sense, they were both capitalists. It wasn't like there was another system trying to, to corrupt well, you. Well, uh, it, it's that, complicated that, because we, we're talking about like the elimination of one, of one of the major forms of ruling class in a government that was sort of like a, a, a compact between these t- two different kinds of ruling class. But I mean, like, say, for example, Thingy wins, the, uh, the North wins in the American War, and they take control over the country. It's not like they are under enormous pressure from outside forces willing to put communism in there. You know, they win and everybody's capitalist and away you go. Like a, a capitalist in the South after the war, he's just want to go and make some money. It's not like there's You're- like the Bolsheviks are in Canada waiting to invade on top of you. You're quite right about that, but I can't resist bringing up the United Kingdom almost intervened on the side of the South for, you know, an, a related reason. Not It's certainly not the same. And that uh, Marx and Engels, as part of the workers' movement at the time, uh, helped shoot that down in the United Kingdom. And that might have turned the tide of the war. So good on the British workers' movement and on uh, Marx and Engels for uh, convincing their state to not intervene in the American Civil War. It's ironic that the English workers' movement was run by some Germans. That's, they're very organized, these Germans. Now, let's keep going. Nothing like a little bit of uh, stereotyping nationalism. Yeah, a little um, crowdery. <laughs> what, what's what's more crowdery than, than ethnic humor? It's okay that's when true. it's Europeans. Well, that's all I know. That's true. I, I was posting that I was going to watch Ireland uh, smash the, the English in the rugby last weekend, but they... <laughs> They, they inflicted a vast colonial massacre on us at the weekend in Dublin, which was very, very poorly taken. Thoughts and prayers. We, we stand with the, with the yeah. oppressed nationality. Right. Up the IRA. <laughs> Let me see. Okay. Under the, let's just keep going a little bit here. Under these conditions, the unorganized advocates of the mass strike as an alternative to permanent organization and the struggle for reforms are marginalized by the organized parties. Like the Russian anarchists in the summer and autumn of 17, the anarchist CNT trade union confederation in the Spanish Revolution, the Bolivian Trotskyists in 51 and the Portuguese far left in 74 to 76. They will be driven to give support to some contender for governmental power and lose any Mm -hmm. political initiative. I think that's fair. I just just think that's fair. Just fucking reality. What he's talking about with the CNT in the Spanish Revolution I mean, if you ever look at the history, and I don't know if I've only looked at like distorted Marxist histories or something, but holy shit, there's a moment where like the previous like reigning Spanish government or or one of the main belligerents in the civil war is like, all right, anarchists, you can have this territory. We will hand you sovereignty. And they're like, no, we're not going to make a state. And then they, then they end up having to, you know, participate in the bourgeois parliament. They, ha- they had their moment, you know, they had like there was a point where the Spanish proletariat could have installed its class dictatorship that could have happened there. I'm not an expert on it, but there's a lot of stuff went on there. You wonder a lot of the shenanigans was, was right. apparently done by the they got all their backing from the Soviets and mm-hmm. they changed the nature of the revolution, too. So you never know what's going on. Yeah, the anarchist mean, Stalinists dropped the ball. What else is new? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Imagine a parallel universe that. Sometimes people talk about where, oh man, but if Lenin didn't happen, it would have been all bad for Europe in the 20th century. Well, what if there was no Stalinists to fuck up the Spanish Revolution? Anyway. Right. There's lots of, there's lots of permutations. And the, it's clear that Lenin was uh, one of the emancipatory figures of the 20th century. But the way that that is paraded around and the way that is uncomplicated is just an excuse for people to promote their own politics, their own ideological horseshit. Let's read this, but I find this particularly interesting, and I'll tell you why in a minute. The underlying problem is is that authority is at bottom merely a means of collective decision-making. To reject authority is therefore to reject collective decision-making and, in the end, render yourself powerless. The existing social structures of authority then reassert themselves. In the end, anarchists themse- have themselves discovered this in Joe Freeman's famous pamphlet, The Tyranny of Structurelessness. It happens just as much within small anarchists' organizations, the existing social structures of authority, then being gender and class hierarchy, etc., as in mass workers' parties. Like, it's interesting. Like, I went to London. When the Occupy happened, the first day it went happened, and they went to St. Paul's Cathedral, and there was like 5,000 people there. 
and what actually happened was 5,000 people got there, right? They all sat down and they were like, all right, like, what are we going to do next? And then obviously, like, about 40 yards from me, there was, like, some of the, like, leaders and they started to, like, set down how things would organize and talk and discuss and it would, like, filter out. And then everybody just basically was kind of waiting for somebody to institute what was happening in New York. Some people were probably linked to the New York group. It happened and then it, it went its way. But this idea that there was no structure there, there completely was. Everybody just turned up and we're all waiting for an authority, but it, it wasn't defined and it just like emerged. And the entire structure of Occupy in London, it came specifically like as nearly a directive from America. They all managed somehow randomly to totally have the exact same structures from all over the world. So there's obviously structure happening, but it's not a designated official structure. So I think this is a very good point. Well, it goes to show, too, that so many left scenes, you know, these anti-hierarchical, anti-organizational scenes become rule by punk scene. At the end of the day, you're now subject to the whims of this other thing. Yeah, it's, you just get a lot of star fuckers, and it's a dictatorship of the most sociable. It's like the rest of capitalist society. Go figure. What I want to say here, though, is that um, just as an asterisk, Joe Freeman is one of the best theorists and historians of the radical feminist movement. If you have never read anything by Joe Freeman, certainly read The Tyranny of Structurelessness, but don't stop there. I ran into The Tyranny of Structurelessness during Occupy, and it was the most fucking obvious thing ever. It was laying out there the intuitive reasons why I could never really consider myself an anarchist for more than a week even though I had a lot of libertarian and autonomist intuitions and commitments and, you know, continue to. There is a very obvious set of social dynamics that pop up. If you are a scientific socialist, be an anthropologist, be a sociologist, be a small group sociologist, and be fucking honest. This is what happens. Delegated social power that is actually accountable, that, that admits right. it for what itself to what it is. I remember I, I thought I thought that there really wasn't a structure. And I was talking to someone, someone that actually helped put it together, I later learned. And so I was sitting there going, wow, gee, gee whiz, isn't this amazing? Uh, you know, there's no there's no leaders. And it's like, no leaders. They're like, take a look around, you know, see who the leaders are. Just don't listen. Like, look, look at who is actually leading things. I don't know where my development went wrong, where somebody had to say that to me. It is truly the most obvious thing in the world, and you need to be ideologically blocked to not see it. It was that day when you asked your parents for a slice of cake and they said no. That's right. That's where it all went wrong. That's where it starts. <laughs> this paragraph here, this little section to me is kind of, for me, a massive critique of the book. Okay, so... The almost uniform failure by processes of bureaucratization and corruption of workers and socialist parties, big and small, tells us that we have not solved the problem of what sort of authority, that is, what sort of mechanisms of decision making will serve the interests of the working class. And he goes on to say, it also tells us that this is an absolutely urgent to do so and that the standard Trotskyist response originated by Trotsky himself to the party regime is not a political question, is profoundly false. The party regime is inevitably the image of the sort of regime we are fighting for. So like this to me is it's like a kind of a throwaway paragraph in the entire book. But the book does absolutely nothing to deal with, you know, how you would go about designing a party. You know, the book is a critique of history. Yet if you come from the Leninist tradition, you know, Mike McNair is coming out of the CPGB and a massive, a massive glaring fault with all of left politics of the 20th century should be this problem. But I, I find it ironic that apart from this one paragraph, I don't think there's another thing said in the entire book on this issue. Am he I does say something in parallel about the councilists. I think, Tom, you're quite right. It's funny, the the big councilist, Anton Panikuk and Leon Trotsky, both have a quote that says something something along the lines of, we have no models. All we have is a history of what doesn't work, essentially which is a funny thing for either of them to say because 
both of them did have things that they thought were the right way of organizing things. Panacook ended up fixated on uh, workers' councils as being the correct form. And that's in the context that McNair criticizes him. But he does say that Panacook was asking the correct question. And I think as leftists, you don't, it doesn't take you that too long to understand. I feel like looking at the 20th century, that that's something that needs to be where we put an awful lot of our emphasis in. We understand the fall and rate of profit at this stage. How's about like experimenting with party design? It seems like a quite a kind of a critical issue that I think is largely left. People either just reject the party form in its entirety or they just stick to it blind. Mm. Right, right. Yeah, there, there's a sociological blockage here. I don't think it's impossible to think this through and to do something different. I just think we consistently get the wrong kind of nerds for something like that. Let's go on to the less positive claim. So this is the idea that, like, you know, you could shut down the country and take power with the strike. Let's have a look. Here's his criticism of it. It should at once be apparent that this cannot continue for more than a few days. If the result is not to be general catastrophe, the workers need not simply to withdraw their labour, but to organise positively to take over the capitalist facilities and run them in the interests of the working class. A truly all-out indefinite general strike, therefore, immediately demands the effective de facto expropriation of the capitalists. As a result, it at once poses the question, will the state protect the capitalist property rights? In other words, it poses the question of political power. I think that's pretty self-evident. Yeah. We'll go on. Let me just read the next paragraph because it's all of, a, all of an argument. Now, of course, what the advocates of the mass strike strategy were calling for was not such a truly all-out indefinite general strike called by the political party. The reality of mass strike movements is something a great deal more messy, of the sort described for Russia in Luxembourg's the mass strike, but seen since then in many different countries at different times. The political regime falls into crisis. Some spark sets off the mass movement. Rather than a single planned, truly all out, indefinite general strike, there is a wave of mass strikes. Some protest actions for political demands, some partial struggles for economic demands. They begin to overlap, and accompanied by political radicalization. But a movement of this sort still poses the general question of political power, and for exactly the same reasons. A mass strike wave disrupts normal supply chains. This can be true even of a strike in a single industry like the minor strikes in Britain in 72 and 74. Equally, however, the capitalist property rights are from their point of view not merely rights to things, but rights of streams of income, which can be made to flow from the social relations which ownership of these things represents. The strike, therefore, in itself is in itself an interference with their property and the mass strike wave threatens the security of their property. They begin to disinvest and to press the state for stronger action against strikers. Jesus, I hate reading the whole feckin' thing, but let me read this one last bit. (laughs) It is a long bit, but let's just read it. A strike wave or revolutionary crisis can last longer than a truly all-out indefinite general strike but it cannot last longer than a period of months, at most a couple of years. In this situation, if the workers' movement does not offer an alternative form of authority, alternative means of decision-making, which are capable of running the economy, the existing social structures of authority are necessarily reaffirmed. So, like, I think that's just common sense. Look what happened in uh, the Egyptian revolution. The whole country was up for that revolution. It was on the streets, and it was a long period of disarray. And what happened in the end? It was so dysfunctional. The left was so unorganized and so weak that it couldn't get control of that revolution. And it just petered itself out because people actually found it more disruptive than the old regime. And what's going to happen? You're going to end up with the old regime again, essentially. Yeah, well, look at the, I love what it says right after. God help me for reading more. But either the military moves in, like in Spain, and, uh, 1873 through four and 1936, et cetera, or the reformists put in power, reestablished capitalist order. The German government in 1918, everywhere in Europe in the immediate aftermath of World War II. I almost don't, I don't know what to say about this. I find this to be very obvious. And anyone that's ever looked at the long run of political power or even just interpersonal dynamics, what a, a vacuum looks like, a power vacuum looks like. I don't know. I don't know, man. What are we doing fucking around with people that can't... Uh... <laughs> 
that can't envision I, I too. that this is is our prime problem. He will take Kautsky's line essentially that autonomous action of this kind is ultimately unnecessary, that you don't actually need extended general strike. I don't know if, if, about proletarian activity in general, but certainly like and like in these indefinite sort of general strike strategies. Or like well, yeah. any economic kind of revolt or uprising, right? Like I I, I think that there's a... Mm, there's, it's, he does, he's not opposed he to strikes. About... He's not opposed to strikes, but these sort of like mass strike. As my strike is a strategy, right? I don't think as he's a, opposed to yeah. popular protest tactics. That's not, that's not what I'm saying. It's division of it from tactic to strategy. Whereas this is Precisely. like, it, it seems to be fetishized as a strategy. And I think, you know, the, the Kautskis would say that, you know, this is just a tactic that can be used in particular circumstances, but this is not going to lead us to communism. Right. I, I, I suppose I'm just thinking that I, I see a lot of people today who who will look at any kind of activity and think like, this is pre-political, this needs to be like shaped. And I think that that gets you to like Syriza more than it gets you to a workers' party. What about this? The all power to the Soviets. So Lenin, he makes out believe that this was like the way around this problem. You get the Soviets and they take power after the mass mm -hmm. strike. But he goes on to critique this. Okay, in this paragraph here, he thinks that it was an illusion. He says almost as soon as the Bolsheviks had taken power, they were forced to form to move from a militia to a regular army. And with it came logistics and the need for a state bureaucracy. The Soviets and militia could not form the core social function of the state, defending the society against external attack. The problem of authority over the state bureaucracy was unsolved. Lenin and the Bolsheviks fell back on the forms of authority in their party. And as these proved a problem in the civil war, almost unthinkingly militarized their party and created a corrupt bureaucratic regime. <laughs> I think there's a lot packed into that goddamn paragraph there as in that unthinkingly is biting like <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's true you think it's true well the, it's it's a shame because they smashed the state in a way they implemented something that kind of they, they really did get rid of a form of order and then basically built it back up it's so maddening like when people say uh, there, there's a i don't know there's a common structuralist claim that you know, Lenin did not truly smash the state. But I think there's a vital sense in that really did get rid of forms of authority that were there. And the tragedy is that because I don't I don't I still don't know how to qualify this exactly, but no matter how sincere he is about replacing all all these forms of authority with like, you know, communes and uh, or I'm sorry, Soviets and like this idea of like a commune state of some kind. It doesn't work, and so he falls back on basically recreating something that is like the czarist state, like the military state. It is almost like he didn't smash the state, even though he kind of did. He smashed the existing one and then just put it together a new one. But is it, is it that he... Here's what I want to say, but I, I feel like is, is naive. That he just you know thought that this would work out, and so when it didn't work out, he just panicked and did the did the bureaucratization thing, and it it was like an accident. But he was pretty he's a pretty smart guy, you know what I mean? Did he really do this and just got sad that it didn't work out, or was this a cynical move? I still I still still chewing on that. Well, like I think the thing is that he, you never know what some of these motives are. That's the thing. You can only look at do you think what they did worked or not. That's the way I approach it. You know, we'll never know a Lenin's yeah. brain. Some people think Lenin, some people who I, I would trust in the left think Lenin is an asshole and some think, think that, you know, he wasn't an asshole. So like, mm -hmm. if people are that split on, on the idea, you can only look at someone's actions and, and critique the outcomes of their actions. What this kind of leads us to believe either that there was something wrong with the society at that point in Russia, that you couldn't have done it, you know, that it couldn't have worked or that essentially maybe Lenin and those guys were nefarious. You know, I don't think there's too many other things you can come mm. to terms with. Well, yeah. there was opposite. Yeah. I mean, you have to you have to look at the the range of opposition to Lenin within the Bolshevik party itself as well. You have to do that separation of the social forces in the Russian Revolution 
and the their representation in the Bolsheviks. And I and I think that there is a results driven way of looking at this that tells us a lot, but also that if if Lenin and the Bolsheviks had their German revolution and we had red Eurasia, I think that a lot of the smart Marxists would have been looking at that edifice as something that needed to go at some point too. Like it, it would very quickly run into some of the same problems. It's an interesting question. It's something that Joe and I have chat about a lot. How to feel about Lenin, how to feel about the Bolsheviks, I think is a question any thinking communist asks themselves uh, pretty sincerely and doesn't right. have like an uncomplicated answer to. Right. Although we do have to, yeah, how to feel about Lenin. It's one thing, but how to think about Lenin, you know, how do we deal with this? Because recently, one of the things I've been doing is not just looking at the oppositional elements within the Bolsheviks, uh, but looking towards some of the Mensheviks that were loyal to the revolution. And there, there weren't, you know, that many. A lot of Mensheviks ended up joining the White Army and, you know, were disgraces to international socialism. But um, Julius Martov, the opposition leader in the Soviet regime, has a, a great pamphlet from 1919 called The Ideology of Sovietism that when I read it, I get more McNair-like vibes from Martov than I do from Kautsky because Martov is for, he, like he's not initially for October, but once it happens, he accepts it as a historical fact and tries to make it as democratic as possible. I think I made a mistake yeah, earlier by conflating the commune state with the Soviet regime. And uh, McNair makes a good point that to blur the lines between the Paris commune and the Soviets, even before the militarization and displacement of Soviet power is, is still like a, uh, an ideological blurring. Yeah, I don't think the Soviets really implemented sort of the the commune form, and you can ask how much they could have, but... Let's have a look at this paragraph here then. Subsequent history confirms this judgment. Workers' councils and similar forms have appeared in many strike waves and revolutionary crises since 1917. In none have these forms been able to offer an alternative centre of authority as alternative decision-making mechanism for the whole of society. This role is unavoidably played by a government, either based on the surviving military bureaucratic state corps or on the existing organizations of the workers' movement. I think that's quite an important thing. Like, you know, yeah. even you go to Argentina in 2000 when they had their currency crisis and everything fell apart, they had workers' councils spring up all over the place, taking over, their, over the factories. You know, they withered away. And who did it lead to? It led to the, what were the, what were the Argentine, what were they, they it was the husband and wife couple called that ruled Argentina. But like they, they you know, a, a kind of general lefty kind of political party organization came through and mm -hmm. not workers councils, which means it, it tells you something. It tells you that imagine that you were imagine that we were working in Amazon Baron. or something. Baron? Uh, yeah, I was going to ask, were you talking Peron, about like Ava uh -huh. and what? No, not the Perons. They were in the 50s. The, it, the example I was thinking of was the Iranian revolution that ends up with the Ayatollah. There's fucking workers' councils in the Iranian revolution. Yeah, loads of them. You know, it was a lefty one. You see, here, here they are. Is it the Kirchners? So the Kirchners were presidents mm. from 2003 to 2015. You know, and I think they had, did they have something like six presidents in a week or something at one stage? <laughs> But imagine we were working for Google or Amazon or something, and they wanted us to figure out how to organize operating this type of business and what structures we'd have. They would get rid of, they would, after it didn't work for however so long, they've done it. Well, look, we've tried workers' councils 26 times in different revolutions. <laughs> yeah, they haven't worked. What What will we try now? We will try this week. Oh, let, let's try workers' councils again. You know, <laughs> you'd lose your job. You, you get packed. No capitalist right. works on that. We should be using similar type of evidence-based approaches. God almighty. That we have to say such things is incredible. It is. It is. But um, I think a lot of people have, a, have an understandable fixation on workers' councils because that was the promise to solve this organizational question, to solve the problem of, you know, the workers' state, quote unquote. If we think about society, like I keep getting back to this kind of point when we're talking about this stuff, that like we need all these different approaches 
like we need democracy in the workplace, but maybe we need other structures for activating and controlling political authority in a revolutionary strategy. You need both. They're both complementary. They both have separate uses. We should be thinking about organizational structures that are, are relevant to the actual task at hand. They can all be left ones and we shouldn't, we should be using them for purpose and not, not out of some kind of loyalty to a particular bureaucratic form. It's kind of incredible you could have a loyalty to bureaucratic form yeah. over and above, like actually winning and, and, and ending up in the communist society. Yeah, that, that last point in, in the paragraph we had read, uh, the role of the decision-making mechanism for the whole society is unavoidably played by a government either based on the surviving military bureaucratic state core or on the existing organizations of the workers' movement. I think that's really the heart of Marxism. I think that's the heart of revolutionary Marxism. It's hard to imagine what an alternative it's hard. It, it is hard to imagine the alternative. And if you don't think it can be the existing state core, then the fact that there's no, you know, that there's an incredibly weak workers movement and for the standards of the 20th century, at least in the United States, no workers movement. You know what I mean? There's a reason why when, you know, these forms kind of fell out and all of the, you know, organized like, like trade unions and social democratic parties and Lenin estates, and they all kind of like got like hit at once people stop taking communism seriously is because there's no more, you know, there's no more real like feasible way to imagine a transition to an alternate state form, like without those existing institutions there or an alternate power center, even if it, you don't want to call it a state, whatever the fuck, you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, that's the thing is, is McNair acknowledges that whatever you're going to call it, you have to deal with the question of the social totality in a revolution pretty much right away. I would say also taking state power is not enough and that that there are complications about what it means to take state power, to conquer state power, that sort of thing. But I think McNair and something that's always that I was always attracted to about this work, you know, in contrast to more anarchist or left on McNair's spectrum thought is that McNair just says, like, power is an important question. And even having gone through anti-political kind of development in my thought since the first time I sat down with revolutionary strategy, I still think his emphasis on politics being the problematic is really useful. And and the fact that, that state power is big exclamation point question, and you can't avoid it. Yeah, I think it's obviously a major problem. I think this book, you know, really just deals kind of with that problem more than anything am i right in seeing that oh quite right i mean uh, this is the metric that he's going to be using throughout the whole book for 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 identifying where these other strategic or tactical turns are coming from and why people make this move or that move what selecting one of these strategies binds you to and alternately for the center you know the one that he actually advocates he he wants to talk about, you know, the problems with what, you know, the vagaries of that kind of position. The entire book is built off of this strategic uh, triforce or I forget, I forget what the, uh, what people usually trifecta. say here. Trifecta. trifecta. Yeah. Trifecta. I'm going with triforce though. Dun, 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 dun. Triforce. <laughs> to me, like, I was just thinking like the book shouldn't be called revolutionary strategy. It should be called revolutionary political strategy. Right. Right. Because it doesn't deal with the social element at all, really. It's nearly entirely at the party level that he's dealing with. Party <laughs> strategy as opposed to yeah. social strategy as well. Right. And if you actually want yeah. to rebuild, if you actually want communism, well, communism, uh, socialism does need to be organized and we shouldn't be abstentionists, but socialism does come from social interests and relations. And people are always asking themselves, like, what would Lenin do and not, you know, posing the question to themselves socially to, to realize that millions of people were, were posing the question to themselves socially for Lenin to have an opportunity to do anything. There is a very externalizing quality to avoiding the, the question of the social. 
I, I think the reason that he doesn't go into the social and that he's talking so much about politics and that's his strategic focus is what he was getting at when he was saying, well, you know, what should socialists do when the class isn't moving? Because I'm going to tell you this right now, like this podcast, not likely to spark the rev, right? Like, I don't know shut what. Up, shut, shut up. Shut up. <laughs> All right, know, cut, I don't cut, know, cut Lexi's feed. Cut Lexi's feed. I don't know, get, <laughs> don't know, get don't know get what that Patreon I, money. The fucking revolution's <laughs> coming. I'm going to be able to buy Bitcoin. I'm going to be able to get myself some like Chinese workers. It's going to be brilliant, lads. <laughs> well, so, so the point being, the point being that political forms is something that Marxists can do while like and, and think about and work out and study and try to get a grip on and prefiguratively deploy within our little weird circles if we have a big enough one that necessitates it and try to figure out how to do this. And I know that sounds laughably naive for the nihilist communist reason that so much of what is done there is terrifying, like truly on the the bottom of the barrel of organizational forms with, with throughout society more generally, you tend to get more democratic stuff out of like Silicon Valley tech companies or startups and, and, sh and shit like that. Like it's truly, it's, it's, it's insane, but it is something that the, you know, the intelligentsia who are sitting around reading books about this can plausibly do where again, I'm sympathetic to people that want to base build, but I'm the wrong kind of nerd for that. Like, and I think most Marxists aren't lined up, lined up for that, that I know. Well, essentially what you're saying is that you're an Owenite. Is that it? An Owenite. You want well, to create your own socialist commune, maybe in the sticks in Arkansas. Oh no. You know me, you know me. I'm a, I, I love, I love nature. I love the woods. Do your Big permaculture. Fan. Do your permaculture. Yeah. yeah. And then, no, no. Uh, melt, smelt metal. <laughs> And make your own guns. Yeah, it'd be great. Oh, all right. You know what? You're convincing me. That sounds pretty badass. But um, McNair's making the point that there is there is a prefigurative element to this. It's drawing it on the utopians isn't totally, you know, silly. Like the prefigurative element to the future, like worker state or whatever, is is figuring out like democratic decision making now. And if there is something like a Marxist center that pops up, you know what I mean? Like how would you run that actually democratically? And I, you know, to their credit, I think they're, they're, they're probably working through these sorts of things in a way, but I don't think they're as clear on the fact that their task is, is probably primarily like a political task. Like they have to figure out a way of making like a, an organization that's like durable, but also could be the kind of thing that would deserve to be inherited by an autonomous movement that pops up. I don't know. I don't necessarily say that stuff as a, to like say, oh, they're not worth it, but they're, they're oriented in a different direction. They're oriented towards trying to spark a social activity and trying to get people together, which I understand, but is, I guess, not where my intuitions lie. Likewise, really. Grant, do you want to read that paragraph that you're uh, salivating over? I just, I did like what McNair does here, because it's not something his acolytes would ever do. But, um, quote, I do not mean by this to glorify the bureaucratic outcomes of the dictatorship of the revolutionary, in square quotes, party, either in Russia or in Cuba. The point is simply that the problem of decision-making authority is not solved by the creation of workers' councils arising out of a mass strike movement. Hence, the problem of institutional forms, which will make authority answerable to the masses, needs to be addressed in some way other than fetishism of the mass strike and the workers' councils. So just the very fact alone that he puts the word revolutionary in <laughs> scare quotes before party, either in Russia or in Cuba. You know, this is this is really, to me, radical stuff to, to make that delineation between the social forces and the revolutionary party and to not conflate party and class the way I think a lot of leftists do, even if you are for a party. And I certainly am, you know, but I, at the same time, I think that something we've been hitting on this, this discussion is 
that the old forms are dead in a certain way. And I think a, a new party would look new. I, I don't, that's kind of mysticism to say, but at the same time, I think it's true. There's something withered about the old forms that we would have to do something differently. And we couldn't have these like nationally delineated same kind of structures that we had in the second international and things like that. I, I just think it's yeah. gonna look a little different. What if Correct. once worker activity returns, I think we can't just do a replay. Let's bring yeah. her on home. Yeah, let's bring it on home. Last last uh, paragraph. I think this wraps it up nicely. Who wants to take this? Will I read it or do you want to read it, Lexi? You read I'll it. Fucking, I'm going to roll out with this one. This is, this, is, this is a great paragraph. We should also have seen that the problem with both strategies centers on the questions of government as a central coordinating authority and the role and structural forms of a bureaucratic coercive state. The right sought to form governments based on that existing state. The left adopted a strategy which, at the end of the day, evaded the whole problem of state authority. In truth, these issues, originally debated between the 1870s and 1900s, are live, unresolved questions in today's politics. In the next chapter, we will see what, if anything, the center tendency in the Second International, led by Karl Kautsky, has to teach us on these issues. On this episode, you heard the theme tune, The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters, and The Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening. Please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. <laughs>